Um, tonight we have the five candidates, it's actually four candidates for the school committee. There are five candidates running. Um, they're vying for two open seats um, for the Manchester seats on the um, Manchester Essex Regional School Committee. Nadia Wetzler is, um, was unable to make it because she had a COVID event in her family. She did test negative, but out of an abundance of caution, she's not here, but in alphabetical order, we do have present here, Eric Bradford, Kristen McLaughlin, Anna Lynn Mitchell, and Erica Spencer. Welcome guys, thank you for coming. Thanks, thanks. And thanks to everyone here who's coming as well. Um, all right, so we're gonna get started. Um, tonight's forum is going to be in two parts. The first part is going to be a moderated um, portion where we share questions ahead of time with all of the candidates so that they're prepared and they respect everybody's time um, with answers. But then hopefully we are going to, in a pretty efficient fashion, get to the portion where we're going to open it up to the audience and they can ask their questions of the candidates themselves. So let's get started with introductions. Um, we'll start alphabetically. And what I'm hoping to do is say, ask you to each introduce yourself. And we'd love to know why you're running for Manchester Essex um, Regional School Committee. And then as part of your intro, if you could, please share two or three of the main challenges that you see are facing the district and what solutions you think might address them. So we'll start with you, Eric. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Bradford. I grew up in Essex, Massachusetts and uh, moved to uh, uh, Vermont to go to the University of Vermont, moved to San Francisco, moved back to Vermont, and then moved here about eight years ago. Uh, my son Adam is 13 years old. He's in seventh grade at the, uh, at the middle school here. Um, my parents still live in Essex. They are the, uh, not the Bradfords that are the parents of the other Bradfords who also live on our streets. <laughs> it gets a little confusing, but Bill and Bonnie Bradford have uh, been there for 50 some odd years. Uh, my brother still lives here in Beverly. Uh, he works for WEI. If you watch Red Sox games, you've probably seen him uh, on TV or heard, heard him talk about the Red Sox on the radio. Um, so I'm, I've been a software architect for pretty much my entire career. Um, I've, I started out in California uh, during the dot-com boom because that was happening and that's what everybody started to do, but I'd always been sort of a computer guy. Uh, after living out there for nine years, I moved back here and can, I've primarily worked remotely, um, first up in Vermont and now here I work for a firm in, uh, in San Francisco, uh, but my clients are all over the place. Uh, when I was in Burlington, I, I was named to the uh, Burlington School Budget Task Force. That was in 2009 after I served on the uh, Town City Budget Task Force uh, the prior year. Um, that was a six month uh, journey that taught me a lot about school budgets. Um, they have sort of a different uh, take on things up there. It's a larger budget. Uh, they have a $53 million budget and they have um, a lot more, uh, you know, refugees and, and uh, special education kids. So there's a slightly different focus. But, um, but that was a really good education in how school budgets works and, and the different dynamics between the schools and uh, teachers and administrations and so forth. Um, here in Manchester, I was a den leader for my son's uh, Cub Scout den for, I guess it was about four and a half years. Um, and that wrapped up a couple of years ago, which frees up some time uh, to do this. My parents were both public school teachers. Um, my dad was uh, the athletic director up at North Yarmouth Academy when I was little. I actually lived in the NYA dorms for the first two years of my life. And then they moved to Essex in 1969. Uh, my dad taught um, in Beverly High School for 20-something um, years, and he was the director of the summer school up there for 19 years. Um, he was also a coach of the men's golf team and the men's basketball team and the women's basketball team at various times. But he was uh, the coach. He, was, he coached something pretty much every season during the entire time that he was there. Uh, my mother was also a teacher. She taught uh, special education at Essex Elementary School um, for 21 years. Uh, my uncle was a headmaster up at Cardigan Mountain School in Canaan, New Hampshire uh, for, for, I think, 25 years. Um, my aunt also taught up there. So I grew up in a very education-heavy environment. I was telling somebody the other day, 
until I was about, you know, 14, I didn't know that there were jobs other than teachers. My parents were teachers, all their friends were teachers, um, you know, and I, I, I spent a lot of time with my dad at the summer school when he was running that, um, and that's kind of all I heard about all the time was unions, teachers, administration, students, so forth. Um, my, I think the profession that I have, software architect, really qualifies me for th this position because rather than sort of taking a position and having to defend the position or coming up with reasons that that position is the correct one, I'm generally handed a problem and I have to solve the problem. And a lot of times I have constraints, external constraints, internal constraints, um, various factors, and I may end up with a solution that's not the one I would have preferred, but there are, you know, the client's got a preference, there's some technology they use, there's all sorts of different things uh, that, that factor into that. So I've got to, my job is to come up with the right uh, decision for that, for that particular project. And I've been in a situation in a lot of cases where, you know, if I make the wrong decision, somebody loses $10 million. Um, and it's, so it's a very, it's, you know, it, the focus is completely on doing the right thing for the client, doing the right thing for the project. And I think that's a similar situation to what we have here, where we're faced with problems, I may have a gut reaction to what I want to see happen, but that may not be the right solution for the community, for the school system at large. And uh, I, I have to dig in, in this case, by talking to people, uh, experts, parents, administration, and uh, coming up with the right solution. Um, I'm not here to, I'm not doing this for myself, for my son, my family, anything like that. As an example, you know, I was never an athlete my son is never <laughs> really going to be an athlete. He's had two open heart surgeries, so he's not going out to the football field anytime soon. Um, you know, but I saw my dad coach teams, and I saw the value of team sports. I saw kids go through all four years of high school with him, and how they developed in uh, you know in doing those team sports with him, and the value of that. So just as an example, I mean, I, I see the value of things like team sports, even though it has nothing to do with me, it has nothing to do with my family. Um, I, I, I can sort of see the whole spectrum of uh, what's good for everybody for the community. And um, lastly, I guess I just wanted to say I'm not here because of any specific school committee decision that I disagree with. And, I, you know, especially the thing that's on everybody's mind is COVID. You know, I don't think, you know, this is a three-year term. I would be very surprised if we had even a single vote that we have to take that has to do with COVID. Okay, this isn't, we're not going back in a time machine and getting angry about what happened two years ago. It's pretty much over. I mean, you know, starting next year, there will probably not be votes related to COVID. That's not why I'm here. I'm here because I understand what the job is through all through my childhood, through my time in Burlington and my time here. I think my experience uniquely qualifies me to do it. And, uh, you know, I see the value. One of the things we taught in Cub Scouts and that my parents taught me was the value of volunteerism. Okay, in my Cub Scout then, we would always do two or three times as much volunteer work as we were required to do because I thought that was really important. My parents demonstrated that to me. Um, sorry, I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm almost done. <laughs> uh, my parents demonstrated that to me. You know, my dad was a member of the Lions Club. My parents ran the, uh, the Lions Youth Exchange Program for decades, and that was an enormous amount of work. Um, after they retired, they moved down. They, they went down to Florida. You know, they're snowbirds. They go down for three months a year. But they would volunteer to teach English as a second language to refugees down there. And that's something I've tried to teach my son. Uh, when I did, you know, when I was den leader for the Cub Scouts, now I'm done with that. This is something I feel like, you know, I can really add some value to the community um, by volunteering for this job. Great. Thank you very much, Eric. All right. Kristen McLaughlin, you're up next. Thank you. I'm pretty good at that. Can you guys hear me? Hi. I'm Kristen McLaughlin. Um, I decided to run for school committee because I love Manchester by the Sea. I love the district. I love my kids, and I love a good public school education. 
I firmly believe in a public school education over a private school. And I think the foundation of a good community is a thriving school district. Um, I have twins in third grade at Memorial and our family moved to Manchester from Danvers in 2018, right when my kids were about to start kindergarten, specifically because of the schools. And sure, Manchester has so much to offer as far as the beautiful beaches, the amazing town center, and the wonderful people and friends that I've met here. But the main reason we moved here is for the schools. And prior to moving, I put a lot of thought and effort into why we chose Manchester. For the, uh, obviously Manchester's ranked really high in US News and World Reports, and there was just another ranking that come out, came out April 26. I think we're number 23rd again. So um, we repeatedly do well in those rankings, but um, I met with principals, I met with superintendents, and I met with people in other districts, multiple other public school districts, before we made a choice to move here. Um, small class sizes, the opportunity to learn a foreign language, especially in elementary school, a vibrant music, art, and performing arts program, and a significant amount of advanced placement programs in high school are not only critical in inspiring the intellectual and creative growth of children, but they also help um, to make a great community. And while I consider myself fortunate to live in this town, like I said, I believe the foundation of what makes a great community is a wonderful school, public school district. Um, some of you know about me, I'm, a, I'm licensed to practice law. I, I've worked in Florida, I'm licensed in New Hampshire, and I'm licensed in Massachusetts. Um, I'm a trial attorney, so as a trial attorney, I go into the courtroom on almost a daily basis. Part of my job is negotiating, and part of my job is working for what people ask me to do. Um, I work in a wide range of public forums. I always have to be calm. I always have to see both sides of an issue. I represent my client like I would represent our community on the school committee. Um, but I also go before a judge, and I also work with the DA or the Commonwealth or the prosecutor, depending on the state I'm in, to work for a resolution that fits everyone. Um, I'm aggressive, but I'm fair, and I understand where both sides are coming from, and I'm always able to stand up for my beliefs. And as the community, I would urge you to put your support in me because I will have your back on the school committee. And if there's something, an issue that you want the school committee to address that's relevant and right for a school committee issue, I won't be afraid to address it or to raise it at a meeting. Overall, I believe trust, transparency, and really good communication are essential to a successful school committee and district. As a parent myself, with my children in the district, I do care very much about upholding our good standing and the integrity of our district. Over the past few years, I really think a phenomenal thing has happened in our community. A lot of parents have come together and shown a desire to participate in school committee meetings. Um, with the continued focus always being on the education of their children. School committee meetings have seen higher standards and higher numbers in attendance than ever before. And parent engagement has increased during public comment. It was exciting to see parents speak with strength and confidence and express their opinions without fear with the hope that their voices would be heard at those meetings. This inspired me to come forward as a candidate for school committee. In these new times, I really believe that parent representation is more important in our schools now more than ever. Parents need and deserve a say 
in our district with regard to how their children are being educated, what they're learning, and who is teaching it. And they should feel supported and encouraged to do so. Many emotionally charged social issues have made their way into education. And as I have said before, I support all children and all families and their right to choose what is best for their children without judgment or criticism. Specifically, I believe it's a parent's choice about what and how a child is influenced by its school district and a parent should have that knowledge ahead of time. As a school committee member, I would use a forthright approach to ensure accountability and transparency. Our key values in the district and the school committee would uphold them. My main goal is to focus on education, funding, and allow parent voices to be heard as much as possible. Our school committee is elected by the community and that's you and me and our neighbors as a whole. And I'll listen and let all parents know that they're supported. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Okay. Anna, you're next. They did not stick to two minutes. Um, I will be, <laughs> I'm gonna be uh, short and sweet. Uh, Anna Lynn Mitchell, I would like to tell you why I'm running for the school committee and hopefully I'll get you a vote. Um, and well, first of all, I do want to thank everybody for being here. It's great to see, you know, so many people interested in our community, in our schools, in, and also the kids' education. I have three kids myself, so this is very important to me. Um, before I decided to run for the school committee, um, keep in mind that this is a lot more than what I anticipated um, with the whole process so far. But before I decided to run, I reached out to one of the school committee members and I asked him exactly what are the roles and responsibility of the school committee, the roles and responsibility of the school administration. How are the two working together? What are some of the topics that um, they need to decide together? Do I need to speak up? Louder, yeah. Uh, maybe if I stand up, that will help. <clears throat> Let me know if this is loud enough. Um, so the reason why I'm running is because uh, budget is the one of the big topics the school committee needs to decide. So as a CFO, I will bring in over 20 years of financial and budget management. Um, I will be able to help to provide a different financial perspective. Uh, and when we're deciding on different um, topics, um, I do think that I can help to assess our current budget process, make it, maybe to make it more transparent or efficient. Um, I can help to look at the different budget limitations and how do we maximize our budget to uh, make the right decisions, um, to do the right initiatives within, um, within our budget limitation, uh, within our you know, strategic plan. Um, at a personal level, uh, I do think that the reason why I'm running is because as one of the few minorities in the community, I think I can provide a different perspective to all the different social topics that we're facing today in a society, especially in this town. And I'm looking forward to dive more into it uh, in the Q&A session. If you have any questions specifically you'd like to ask me more after the meeting, happy to chat. I'm very honored to be part of the process and thank you again for being here. Thank you, Anna. Erica Spencer, you're next. Hi, um, I'm going to stick to two minutes, too. Um, this crowd is definitely not what I was expecting when I signed on um, to this election. But uh, I think it's a testament, this type of engagement is a testament to our district. And so regardless of the outcome of this election, that's a win right there. Uh, my husband and I moved here 13 years ago. And uh, similar to Kristen, we moved here with the biggest objective being to find the right public school system for our children. At the time, we had a one, a three, and a five-year-old. Um, today, our boys are in seventh, ninth, and 11th grade. They've all been at MERSD since kindergarten. Um, I also have two nephews that are at Memorial in kindergarten and second grade. So I have loved ones in all three schools, and the success of our public school system is really near and dear to my heart. Over the last uh, 13 years, I have volunteered as often as I could in our schools um, as a working mom. I've served two terms as school counsel, 
both at Memorial and at the middle school. I've co-chaired an auction that raised tens of thousands of dollars for our school system. I participated in the Maravista and DC task force, and I've served on a bunch of different committees along the way, including most recently a de facto committee uh, that was set up to find COVID vaccines for teachers and staff in this district at a time when finding a vaccine appointment felt like you needed a degree in coding. Um, my husband has been a soccer coach pretty much three seasons a year for the last 13 years. Um, and as a family, we've tried to do everything we could to contribute to our public school system. In terms of deciding to run for this position, I will tell all of you what I told my three boys who as teenagers were not overjoyed by the idea <laughs> of their mother seeking public office. Um, but what I said simply was sometimes you've got to be willing to stand up and fight for what you believe in and you can't always expect other people to do the hard work for you. I really believe this, and I believe we really are facing some critical decisions in our district. Um, Erica, you asked us to address some of the challenges, and I think it's pretty obvious that aligning our budget with the educational goals of this district is going to be a challenge, um, as is the renegotiation of contracts that's coming up this year. My background, first as, um, I spent several years as, at a public accounting firm where I earned my CPA, um, and then as a practicing attorney for the last two decades, I think uh, provide me with a background and a skill set that will help assist with those two challenges. Um, I have the financial analysis, and I also have the advocacy skills, and I hope those things would be assets to the school committee. Thank you. Fantastic, y'all did a great job. And I know it's a real challenge because, you know, trying to stick to time is hard. Um, we have a lot of talented um, candidates, clearly, um, and we have one more who's not here, and I'm going to actually read the statement that she sent ahead, and I'm gonna try to be, you know, quick and lively about it. <laughs> um, so this is from Nadia Wetzler, who is running, um, she's also an attorney, we've got some good attorneys on the, on the bench here. So I'm gonna read this. Um, this is from Nadia. I'm running for the school committee for two reasons. First, I believe prioritization is a high, um, I'm, first I believe prioritizing a high quality public school education is critical to the well-being of our town and its ability to, to attract families looking for a community where to raise their children. A well-balanced education is fundamental to raising children who can become engaged citizenry and compete effectively in the local and global economies. Secondly, I strongly value public service and believe Engage, an engaged citizenry is key to a thriving community. Serving on the school committee will enable me to donate my time and talent for the benefit of the school district in the town of Manchester by the sea. My husband, three children, and I moved to Manchester in late August 2016. We currently have a son in the 10th grade, a daughter in the 6th grade, and a daughter in the 3rd grade. After spending six years in Germany where I worked at Applied Materials offices in Frankfurt, we decided to return to the U.S. Given I support teams globally, including in Europe and in the US, it makes sense to look for a home based in the East Coast. My manager suggested I transfer to Gloucester, where Varian Semiconductor is, which is an applied uh, subsidiary. I grew up mostly in Maryland suburbs and was not familiar at all with Cape Ann. We were looking for a family-friendly community and a high-quality public school system. Several people I reached out to strongly recommended Manchester. We moved into our home days before the school year started. We loved the small town feel that our kids could walk and bike with friends or on their own out and slowly gain their independence. Over the past several years, we have largely been happy with the schools here. However, the Manchester Essex Regional School District is facing major challenges. First, as described in the operating budget detail of the FY 2023 school district budget, Instructional services are declining as a percentage of total spending due to staffing reductions needed to fund mandated spending growth in other areas. This means cutting teachers and programs critical to meeting the state, state admission of the MERSD strategic plan overview of providing a high quality comprehensive educational experience. It means our children will lack opportunities offered by private schools and other school districts. Second, as evidenced by the challenges faced as a result of the COVID ep epidemic or pandemic, 
The school needs to evolve to meet changing times. Most days our son reports that one or two teachers are out sick, some as long as 10 days. No substitutes are provided, nor does the school appear to have any means or flexibility for hybrid or remote learning so that teachers can support students even when required, um, required to quarantine. I believe our school children deserve better. As a school committee member, I would look for other ways to ensure our schools are appropriately funded. This may mean exploring alternative public funds um, and or opportunities for private funds. Our son's biotech class is possible thanks to the generous contribution of area businesses. And yes, this means considering a proposition two and a half override. In closing, some words on the plan, the vision of the graduate resonates with me in particular the empathetic global citizen and critical thinker. I recently read an op-ed piece by Ibu Patel in the New York Times where he stated that the job of schools is to provide a broader context for the facts of the world and pass along knowledge and skills so that students can navigate it. He noted that schools play an important role in shaping students to participate as citizens in a diverse democracy. I came of age when the Berlin Wall fell to, and the Soviet Union broke up into independent nation states. Internet was just starting to take off. The world has only grown more complex. There are jobs today that did not exist when I graduated from college. I'm certain my children will have opportunities I cannot even dream of today. Their ability to take advantage of such opportunities depends largely on the quality of their education. Thank you, Nadia. <laughs> Okay, so here we are. Um, we're well into our, um, our forum. So what I'd like to do is maybe um, switch up the format a little bit of the questions. So this is a surprise to, to you guys. I'm just trying to consolidate time. So I'm going to combine the first question and the second question. And that way we can spend time on it and then have one more question and then get right to you. So the first question focuses on two things, the role of the school, school committee, which is fundally, fundamentally about setting district policy. It's about approving budget and negotiating contracts and hiring and evaluating the superintendent of schools. Now this year, this is where the pivot is, this year this district borrowed heavily from reserves and made significant cuts to programs and teachers to deliver a budget that was approved by both towns. Each one of you in your, in your ways, um, in your intro, refer to that. Um, how would you approach the 2024 20, budget process, and how do you see your role in the district's budgeting planning? And also, a bonus question, um, and this should be quick, do you support a Proposition 2 and a half override next year? So let's start with Erica Spencer. Um, okay. Um, I am still trying to follow. So you, you want me to address one and, the budget. one and two at the same time, but really mostly two. The budget. I think okay. yeah, we're skipping it's, one. It's, I think there we go. The reason I did that actually is yeah. because everyone knows that that's a central focal point for everybody. Sure. And I thought we should just get right into it and focus on that. Okay. So I apologize for mixing that yeah, up. Yeah, no, no problem. I just wanted to figure make out things more efficient. going to combine one in there. But... Um, yeah, so the budget, I think it's no surprise that this is probably the toughest challenge facing our district. Um, in terms of how I would approach it, I guess the thing I can promise you is I'll approach it with a fresh set of eyes and with a background that has the benefit of financial analysis. Um, in many senses, the role of reviewing the district budget is a lot like what I did as an auditor. You're looking critically at every line item and the expenses and how to justify it. Um, I would love to tell you that I think I can sit there and look at all the numbers that the school committee looked at this year and come up with a different result. And, and maybe I can, um, but I don't think I can really give you anything credible in terms of how I would reach a different conclusion um, other than a fresh perspective and also a desire to look into, see, uh, to look into whether there are additional sources of revenue. Um, it strikes me that right now there are a lot of grants accessible through COVID relief, um, from uh, DEI type grants, there are social emotional grants, and I'm sure that, again, this is not news to the school committee, um, but I think it's worth considering every additional source of revenue and all the expenses that we have. Um, I guess it, it, it almost goes without saying that the cuts that were made this year are, are really significant. I make no mistake about it, it is a detriment to our students. and. I'm going to try to confine myself to two minutes, so I'm not gonna review all of them right now, but I will say that I think cutting a language program 
My kids and their peers had the benefit of a K through six language program. It enriched their experience at Memorial, but beyond that, it prepared them for future language courses, both in high school, you can enter at a higher level, also at college, if you've had the benefit of a K through six, something I didn't know, but it does matter. Um, beyond that, it matters toward cognitive development, and it matters to an appreciation of the diversity of different cultures and the global world that our kids are going to have to enter. Um, so I could go on and I could also talk to you about cutting teachers in the math department. I have a high schooler, I have two high schoolers, sorry. Um, <laughs> that happened quickly. Uh, and cutting a teacher in the math department right now is, is very surprising to me because the math experience at the high school this year has been super challenging. Um, I say all this and I want to acknowledge that I do not think the school committee wanted to make these cuts. I don't think they looked at the budget and said, hey, this would be a great idea. I think they were faced with a really difficult situation um, and we're not going to come out of it quickly. So uh, you've asked us to address the override and I, I don't think I can in good faith give you any specific answer on the override without looking at numbers. It would be irresponsible. Uh, the one thing I can tell you is that as a taxpayer, if you ask me whether I prefer a declining school system and the inevitable economic impact of that or a tax override, they both have economic consequences. Um, we shouldn't forget that. So I guess that's where I come out on that. That's really good. Thank you for addressing all of that. Eric Bradford, how about you? I'm going to try to remember which parts got cut out and which parts were left. Um, and I'll just uh, sort of give sort of my general philosophy on this. You know, I told you I, can't, I come from Burlington, Vermont. I don't want to throw Burlington, Vermont under the bus too much, but it's a very different situation up there. Um, you know, they, can't hear me? Yeah. I'll stand up. Um, you know, when I, when I, for one thing, you know, the schools up there, to be kind, are not great. Nobody's moved, really moving to Burlington, Vermont for the schools. And I know from being on the budget task force up there that the scrutiny given to the budget is nowhere close to what it was here. I mean, one of the, like most of these people, one of the reasons I moved here was for the schools. You know, um, the, 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 the rankings are fantastic. And one of the things I've been really encouraged by, in addition to the special education department, which my son is involved in, um, is, the, the level of scrutiny that's given to the budget. I mean, it's, it's shocking to me to see people really digging into numbers in the six figures, you know, when the schools are so important to this town and, uh, you know, the property values and everything else. Um, so it, it's a little hard for me to, to, to uh, say, well, I think it's okay to cut a French teacher. It's, I think it's okay to scale back the music program. To me, the schools are such an unbelievable return on investment, such an unbelievable value. And one of the things I love about living here is uh, there are a lot of people, like, like my fellow candidates here, who moved here for the schools because they care about their kids, they care about their kids' education, they care about the programs here, they, they just care about their kids. And that's part, a big part of why they're here. And it, it sort of sets the tone for the whole town. And so I, I can't get into line items. I mean, I'm sure, you know, once I start, I'll, I'll get into alternative sources of funding. And, I've, you know, I've spoken a little bit to Ken Warnock, uh, who supported me running for this. Uh, but we'll, you know, we'll get into the nitty gritty once we get there. But my general philosophy is, you know, I feel like the schools are a fantastic uh, value to the town. And cutting teachers, cutting programs to serve short-term you know, deficits is just incredibly short-sighted. I'm a big proponent of looking at the long view, looking at curriculum shifts, you know, maybe that includes attrition over time, um, and sort of handling budgets over, over the course of a long period that way. But when we get into things like, you know, we had to pull $200,000 out of the reserves for COVID last year. That's what people wanted, so we did it. We incurred the bill. Now we've got to pay the bill. You know, we made a commitment to Essex to build their elementary school. Taking, drawing down on the reserves and not replenishing them affects the credit rating, which means that theoretically, if we don't do that, we could have to push off building the Essex elementary school. And I don't think that's a, that's a good alternative. So 
I would, ha I would have to look into it a little further, but as it stands right now, I would support the Prop 2.5 override. Thank you, Art. That was perfect. Kristen, you're next. Oh, we're all doing it? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm I think I'm pretty much on the same page as a lot of people in the town in that we're all, as parents of kids in the school, disappointed in the elementary, um, elementary foreign language program cut. We're all disappointed to hear a math teacher position was taken away. Um, however, not being on the school committee the past year, I don't know what went into that. Um, more so than anyone else who listened to school committee meetings. And I give the school committee so, the utmost credit in making those decisions because I know those decisions were difficult for them because you can't just go cut a math teacher and expect everyone in town to not care. Um, so I, I recognize that. Um, I think as a school committee member, I would investigate what the priorities would be and how can we make uh, the future years fiscally responsible but also um, inc incorporate the foreign language program back. So I think one of the questions that were posed um, was what, pro what, what budget programs were we going to revisit in the next fiscal year and I would absolutely try to revisit the foreign language uh, cut from the elementary program, and as well as any other education um, academic uh, positions that are cut, such as math. I think parent, um, I would approach the next fiscal year, if I was on the school committee, with openness, um, taking the parent desires into consideration, and allow them to weigh uh, into the budget decisions. But um, as far as proposition two and a half, override goes, I would support that. I truly believe that having a strong public school system uh, lays a foundation for a strong community and encourages growth in our community. It encourages other people to move here. And uh, like, like, like Eric said, our taxes may go up, um, but I believe that having a strong school system it would would really benefit and have a good return on investment for that. You did okay. answer Thank it. You. Um, and um, just so, just for context, I mean, the conversation around a proposition two and a half with the budget has been around sort of taking a look at the school district and having a reset. That's sort of the, the mindset for going into next year. So, so that was a great. You guys are doing great. <laughs> Anna Lynn. Let me stand up so you guys can all hear me. Um, I have managed budget from $2 million to $300 million. Um, so I always go into it with the same approach. It's for me to understand the current process in the past, um, what's been working, what's not working. And so that I can also evaluate all the stakeholders, the expectations throughout the process. At the end of the budget, when uh, the outcome that we're all trying to achieve is really to make sure that we each, uh, achieve and meet everybody's expectation for all the stakeholders. So that's one aspect I'll make sure that I try to understand and also understand, uh, work closely with the school administration on the different restrictions of the revenue sources and how are some of the things, uh, keep in mind we're a public school, so there are some of the funding and expenses we just have to do. There are some of the things that we have flexibility on. I would like to understand that. So I can really dissect the numbers and understand what are some of the um, limitations of the budget that we can identify right away. What are some of the potential uh, areas that we have flexibility to really prioritize? And how does that align with our strategic plan as, uh, for the entire school district? For the, we have a uh, three-year plan. And as the plan that it is right now, it's hard for me without knowing too much about it. It's uh, hard to see which one uh, is already being committed, which one we're still trying to earmark for 2000, uh, year, you know, FY, fiscal year 2024. So I would like to understand not only the process in the, in the past, but also what are some of the remaining expectations and also priorities that we have to do. So understand the full picture in the beginning will help us to really uh, figure out the timeline of the budget. I think another part is the involvement of everybody that's, um, that, that are interested. 
a lot of times I do think that communication is also key. Um, I do think right now with a lot of debates that we have uh, when it comes to budget, uh, some of it is because the misinformation on the budget and also miscommunication on the budget. So I do think that as a CFO, uh, I'm really good at communicating, communicating the budget narratives. So I will use my skill set to communicate that to the parents and to the community. So everybody understand what's in the budget so we can uh, all be on the same page and help to uh, bring the transparency to the entire budget process. Um, do I support the proposition to and how? I do think that I will need to understand the budget more, understand what are some of the give and takes that we have to do. Um, I do, one thing I do have to say is once we die, I, do, I came from an Asian culture, uh, academic is very important to me. That being said, I do think there are social aspects of things that we do have to raise the awareness to our children, and that's very important too. Such as DEI. DEI could be $5,000, could be $50,000. So it is very important for us to understand how much do we have to work with on the budget side. Then we can work with the school administration, with the parents, with the community to really understand what we need, what we want for our children. Hope that helps. Yeah, it does. That was really good. And thank you for being flexible to changing it up a little bit. Um, OK, so we're going to move on to the strategic plan. Um, the school committee worked on a strategic plan last year. Um, can you share your thoughts on that plan? What would you prioritize? Are there specific cha changes you'd like to see? Um, and then also a bonus question I'd like to ask is, um, are there any existing school policies, because it's related to the, the strategic plan, uh, that you think should be revisited or reintroduced? Um, so that's just a sort of a bonus question for you. So let's start with you, Chris McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, so. I, um, I read the strategic plan, we've heard the strategic plan at school committee meetings, and I think the school p committee put so much effort into incorporating so many different core values and elements into the plan. Um, I think the question was, um, what would I prioritize? And I think, uh, for me, student achievement is the hands down priority in our strategic plan and it should be the priority for our students. Um, the school should uh, not only have academics as its number one, but then also within the strategic plan, you promote kindness, you promote respect, you promote um, equity, and you use all of the resources in the community to get to those values that we all have. Um, I think as a community, we all share the same values and we all care about our kids, we all care about our families, and every parent does the best they can to raise a good child. So I think the strategic plan um, as a whole incorporates academics, but it also incorporates having everyone come together as a community to achieve those goals. Um, is there a second part of that question? Well, the only thing I, I mean, didn't it, it get was to. sort of a, a bonus, which said, you know, are you are there any existing school policy that you think should be revisited or introduced? And if if not, then that's okay. No, not off the top there of my head. Go. I don't have an answer for that right now. Okay, thanks. Well, that's great. Um, Eric. I hope you can hear me. I, my brother's a lot better at this than I am. I don't, I don't have my radio voice, so I'm just going to do my best. You're doing great. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I think the strategic plan is fantastic. I think it checks all the boxes, um, social, emotional learning, equity, inclusion, all these things. One issue I have with it is that it is largely aspirational. It talks about what we would like to do. It doesn't really provide, in, in most cases, concrete steps for for accomplishing those goals um, or metrics for determining that we've accomplished the, accomplished the goals. Um, so I think, you know, one of the ways we can do that, I'm going to echo a little bit of what Anna Lynn said, is we need to uh, communicate with the community to see how things are going along these lines to determine whether, you know, we're, we're queuing to what we set out to do with the, uh, the strategic plan. And more importantly, we need to speak to the students and I, I know you know the school the, the school committee I watched several of the meetings and they have 
one student that comes on and says, here's what the students think. And he, he says what the students think. And I think it, there needs to be a lot more than that. And you know, somebody reached out to us uh, recently and asked about uh, LGBTQ issues. And I just want to read what I responded because I, I tried to freestyle this with somebody the other day and I dropped important parts. So I, I'm just going to read it. I strongly feel that a deeply held fundamental rejection of racism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, and any other type of intolerance is, to an increasing degree with each passing year, table stakes for graduates heading out to make their way in the world. To the extent that schools are charged with preparing students to be empathetic global citizens that are well suited to the variety of experiences that life will bring them, I believe that it's critical that schools do all they can to ensure that students shun these types of biases as a core component of who they are. It's an unfortunate fact that communities that have little diversity can be a breeding ground for prejudice. I, I experienced this when I was growing up in Essex, unfortunately. Um, you know, but I've been encouraged that my son, who's in seventh grade, tells me that he's never heard or witnessed an incident, insult, or comment that has arisen from any fear or hatred of anyone because of their racial, sexual, or cultural differences. But this is purely anecdotal and it doesn't necessarily indicate the lack of a problem. So as a school committee member, I want to push for extensive communication with the student body at all levels, anonymously where appropriate, to determine what work still needs to be done. Asking for students' experiences with these prejudices, their level of comfort with expressing their views, whether they would feel completely comfortable coming out within the school community. These are the types of questions when answered honestly in a safe environment that will let us assess where uh, the, the district is in terms of tolerance. And I think that, that carries forward to a lot of the uh, aspirations of the strategic plan. Um, you know, when I was growing up, uh, I went to Hamilton Run Regional High School. There were kids who were dear friends of mine who didn't feel that they could come out of the closet until they were much older, and that is just heartbreaking. And I think as long as that, if that situation exists here, if every kid can't answer honestly that they would feel comfortable coming out, this again, this, this is just part of the strategic plan, um, then there's still work to do. And I think you can carry that forward to a lot of the aspects of the strategic plan. So, thank you. Um, Erica Spencer. Um, okay, so I was ju I just wanted to say that the strategic plan for those who may not have leafed through it recently, it's um, four different initiatives which encompasses 21 different objectives. So we're talking about a really comprehensive document, which I agree with what Eric said. It's um, it's really impressive. I think the biggest challenge, also I think Eric mentioned, is uh, the devil's in the details, right? 21 objectives is a lot um, for anyone to carry out, and we do need to really think about implementation and prioritization. Um, uh, when I looked at this, a couple of things jumped out at me, and again, like th there's 21, so there's a lot of important stuff in here, and it, when I um, used my two minutes, which is now down to like one minute and 10 seconds, um, I'm not gonna touch on all priorities, so don't, please don't assume that these are the only things that matter. But um, one of the initiatives is with respect to long-term budgetary planning, and I would really encourage the school committee to look at that more comprehensively in terms of the whole child. Um, we need to be mindful of both athletics and the arts when it comes to our budget. I think anybody who walked by the fields tonight and maybe noticed the work that's being done out there, the piecemeal project to put together um, the turf fields to make them safe for play is just one sign of what's been an ongoing problem and a real need to invest in, um, in our field space, invest in athletics, and it's similar with the arts. So we need to find a way to incorporate those into our budget, even though we're dealing with really limited resources. Um, another thing I think is important, one of the strategic initiatives relates to social emotional awareness. And I think no matter where you come out on that issue, we all have to be aware of the fact that mental health issues right now are staggering. Um, students across America, and our district is no exception. Children, adolescents are facing a real mental health crisis, so um, we should be prioritizing, making sure that we have the right social and emotional um, tools to teach our children to meet the challenges that they're confronting. So those are two that I wanted to use my time to address, but there are many others. That was excellent, thank you. Anna Lynn? Uh, so I might be approaching the strategic plan by more uh, technical aspect. So uh, this is a great plan over three years. Uh, so I might, I would have liked to see it tweak a little bit to 
clearly identify which one is happening, which one are the priority for whatever fiscal year. Uh, another thing is important for strategic plan, the entire plan to carry through, is to make sure that we uh, understand what is the accountability, how is it measured, is it tied to uh, the principal or whoever the teacher's performance reviews, um, so, and what is the progress for every single one. That's something I would like to understand before, uh, uh, to tell you the truth, everything, like you mentioned, there are so many things on the strategic plan, every single one is, uh, is very important, and it's very, um, it's important for us to find the right balance. Not only we focus on the academic, but also the social aspect of the things, the DI and, and everything else that everybody talk about here. But is that right balance that we have to find? And most importantly, what I'm excited about is to dive right into the budget and help everybody to understand what we are working with. So we can, uh, we can start prioritizing what's important to the community. That was great. Um, I want to thank you all um, for, for, for moving along with us. I mean, it's, it's clear that there's a lot of issues. They're wide ranging, they're complicated. You can't address them all in one forum. So we tried to get in with the strategic plan and then the money. So those were the two things we ended up dropping a question. I really appreciate it. Everyone, you guys did a great job and I do think we should sort of acknowledge it. to the audience. So let's get started. Um, you guys have been listening very patiently. Um, any questions? And this is going to be handled very ably by you. Hello, folks. Um, so I'm going to lay a little bit of groundwork for how we're going to run this. And uh, then we'll dive right in. So first of all, um, I, I want to say this is a really good showing. I'm very pleased to see this. This is very important. Um, uh, these are uh, very important seats to be here and to be in, uh, evaluating these folks for. And uh, I appreciate you being here tonight. Um, so I'm going to be asking uh, people to raise their hands and ask questions. Uh, this microphone does not amplify, obviously. Um, it's there only so that, Cape, uh, so that uh, the uh, 1623 studios can record this. So when you ask a question, I'll be bringing you a microphone so that you can speak into the microphone and we can hear your questions up here and it'll be recorded for posterity. Um, so a little bit of quick audience participation. Who is here is from Manchester? Okay, who here is from Essex? Who here is from neither Manchester or Essex? <laughs> All right, excellent. <laughs> So, um, Essex people, of course you're welcome to ask questions. These people, although they're representing Manchester on the school board, uh, they're going to be making decisions that are going to affect your kids too. And we're one big community, so just, just to make that clear. Um, we're not going to form a line. We're going to raise hands and ask questions. And I will wander around the room and pick people. If you have a question that's for all of the board uh, uh, candidates, then I will randomly pick from the people to speak first, limit people to about two minutes. If you can be briefer, um, please do. Uh, as much as possible, be direct and specific with your answers, and we'll just try and move things along. Uh, I think that's about it. Let's go. Um, right here. Oh, uh, yes, when you, when you stand up, give me your name and your town. Uh, my name is Jory Everett. I live in Manchester. And my question is really for everybody. I'm here, oh, and first off, also everyone saying accountability and transparency is huge, so whoever gets to position, if we really hold that to the fire, is excellent move. Um, so my question is really about literacy. If anyone has awareness, that is a massive part of the budget, and you basically can't access any academics if you don't have the ability to read. Uh, there's been a massive shift with Massachusetts and the Department of Education from balanced literacy to science of reading. So I'm curious who is aware and understanding of where Manchester is in the need to continue the shift and the support for teachers and administration and family members all for understanding what struggling readers really need. Thank you. All right. Um, 
Helen? Um, I'm not familiar with the topics I have to say, but I think what I would probably do first um, to is to work with the school uh, administration to understand exactly what's the issue. What are some of the state and federal reg regulations and guidelines that we are following? What are some of the flexibility that we can do more uh, for our children? Kristen. Thanks. Um, I would say I'm not familiar with how I could help or how I could, as a school committee member, do something more, but what I would do is listen to you as a parent with your concerns and bring it I would investigate more, see where our district's lacking, and see if there is anything our committee could do to make improvements. Um, as far as it currently stands, I, I can't speak to that, but I would make it better if we could. Erica Spencer. So I'm sorry, this is gonna get redundant for you because I don't have direct familiarity. I mean, the one thing I think I, I would say is, um, I'm not going to come to the school committee and pretend I know all the answers. I, as I've told you, my background is in law and in finance. I'm not an educator, um, but I also know I'm not an educator. And so when it comes to decisions that are very specific to new literacy guidelines, that's who I'd be looking to. I'd be looking to understand um, and bring knowledge to our community, um, to the committee in terms of how to address the type of concerns you're raising. But I'm sorry, I can't give you better guidance. Eric Bradford. I'm gonna ask my mom about that. <laughs> uh, she was a special educator. Um, I'm, you know, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna join the crowd here and say, I think you're referring to some specific uh, program or regulatory issue that I'm not familiar with. The one thing I can say is that, you know, one of the things I've been really happy with here in the district is, you know, my son's been on IEP ever since we got here. Um, they've been really super uh, flexible and supportive of him. And um, I think the, the attitude to solve problems like the ones that you're describing is there. So in terms of the specific tactics to, to address the issue that you're talking about, um, I think the will is there. It's just a matter of sort of threading the needle and figuring out what needs to be done, who needs to be spoken to, talking to the right people, and, uh, and uh, getting it done. Thank you. Uh, one thing I forgot to say, uh, we're going to stay here and ask as many questions and stay as long as we, um, as people want to, but is there anybody out here who, like, has to go, at, like, I have to be at work at 9 p.m. <laughs> and has a question that they want to ask? All right, then let's just keep going. Next. Way back. Uh,
sorry, I had a real question. I'm glad you felt this is direct to anybody that would love to choose. Um, so budget's been talked about a lot tonight. Um, and serving on the school committee, you need to work with town boards, not only in Manchester, but also Essex. Those boards being Quinn Common and Board of Selectmen. How do you see your role in the school, com school committee building a consensus with those boards by also staying true to the school role of advocating for the best academic experience for our kids? Okay, Ms. Spencer first. Um, well, thank you for the point of clarification, Pam. Um, with kids in the high school, I'm, I'm glad to know that uh, there hasn't actually been a position, well, it has been eliminated, but we haven't lost a math teacher. Did I get that right? We've lost a position. Sure. We've lost a position. You haven't lost any course offerings or Excellent. class sizes, class size benchmarking by each section. So same exact program of studies as last year. So that's great to know. Just deliver it with fewer people. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm going to also hope we deliver it with fewer loss of teachers <laughs> over the course of the year. But that's a different topic. Um, we, had a, we had a difficult year at the high school in the math department. But I will move on to Caroline's question, um, which I believe was how I see my role in working with different committees. I guess the best thing I can tell you is that I wouldn't be running for this position if I didn't really enjoy working with people. Um, I'm a team player. I have always worked uh, professionally as part of a team. And I think I am able to advocate for a position while also being respectful and mindful of uh, varying opinions. Um, I think that my professional background has given me a skill set to help arrive at consensus, excuse me, consensus, um, and to look at problems creatively. Um, so I think that's how I would approach those positions and working with um, different, different members of the community uh, and different groups. Did that answer it? Ellen. Uh, to address your, uh, the, what the math um, teacher cut earlier, um, I, this is where, to my question earlier about the communication on the budget narratives. Uh, I was very surprised too. So I actually scheduled an appointment uh, w with Pam last week to understand a little bit about all the different topics that we're talking about. And I was surprised as well that wasn't a cut. So I do think communication on the budget uh, is very important. Um, I work on the many different board committees and, uh, and board meetings and whatnot. Uh, so how I approach uh, is really about managing the different personalities and understanding everybody's priorities and what they want uh, and having a mutual understanding and listening to, um, to, um, to exactly what their, um, not the personal agenda per se, but like every, everybody have uh, what they are, uh, the outcome they're trying to achieve. And it's, the key is to align this together and then try to align everything with the budget as well. So we all come with a mutual understanding uh, at the end. That's how I approach it. Yeah, I think uh, part of the question had to do with sort of a Manchester versus Essex thing. Um, I grew up in Essex. My parents are in Essex. I love Essex. I came that close to moving to Essex when we came here. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't feel any sort of uh, hometown uh, bias one way or the other. I don't think that's going to be an issue. Um, I know each of the boards you mentioned have slightly different focuses. Uh, what those focuses are, I think, is partly a product of their their uh, charge and partly a product of the individuals on those boards. So I think one of the first things, I've heard a little bit about this, uh, it hasn't really been relevant to some of the things we've been talking about, but um, sort of what, what the, the sort of varying interests are. I think for, from my perspective, you know, we're advocating for the schools. That doesn't mean um, that we're going to say run the taxes up and it's, it's just a big battle. Um, you know, I've, I've come from a perspective where pay a lot of property taxes up in Burlington, Vermont. I, I'm, I'm on that side as well. Um, but I, to answer the question, I think, uh, you know, it, it's really going to come down to understanding what the, the varying interests are and uh, what our role is in uh, trying to, to uh, navigate uh, that whole issue. Mr. McLaughlin. Thanks. Um, I think in my career on a daily basis, I'm constantly working with uh, conflicting viewpoints in one form or another, uh, whether I'm representing my client um, with opposing counsel wanting something different than what we want, negotiating and constantly working together to reach some type of common ground is something I do on a daily basis. Um, 
in my career. But in addition, I've been on the Children's Law Center of Massachusetts board. I was on the board of directors for that um, starting in 2010 for about 10 years. On that board, we uh, did work with other, uh, we, we worked with funding issues, budgeting issues, um, and other issues on ways we could help the children on that committee. So um, with regard to that or working with other boards in other towns, it's just the same as working, uh, and, and I can't say it's just the same because I haven't done it before, but I would presuppose that we could work together um, to find common ground and to get everyone's opinions heard and uh, to continue representing what we're here for, which is the kids in our community and in our school district and have them always be first and foremost um, represented. Thanks. Hi, I'm Lindsay Banks. I'm from Manchester. Um, and I want to thank the organizers of this forum and also for the candidates. I want to thank you for putting your hat in the ring for public service. So, um, so my question is for all four of you. Um, do you support the district's anti-racism resolution that was passed in 2020? Um, and if you could be specific as to why or why not you support the resolution. Um, and the resolution reads in part, the Manchester Essex Regional School District and all the school districts in the Commonwealth must guarantee that racist practices are eradicated and diversity, equity, and inclusion is embedded and practiced for our students, families, faculty, and staff. Thank you. And I'm going to go first. Um, I thought about this a lot um, during this process. Um, so to me, anti-racism, everybody feel very differently about anti-racism because our personal experience um, with racism. What I do think that we need to understand is the society has evolved quite a lot in, uh, within our generation. Think about it, over the past, just 50 years ago, I could have been arrested for being in an interracial relationship. Just 20 some years ago, when 9-11 happened, a lot of people would you know, brown or yellow skin were attacked. Today, Asian people are attacked because COVID. So my understanding with racism, uh, it impacts how I view anti-racism. And it's also very different from everybody's view. My kids are gonna have different view. Not only they have to figure out what that means to them, internally they gotta figure out what that means to themselves because they're biracial. My point is, uh, my view on anti-racism is the same with how I view many different social topics, bullying, you know, gender identity and whatnot. I do think that we just need to be mindful that everybody is different. The society is evolving. We need to respect the differences and understand and recognize the differences. Our children uh, grow up in this nice, beautiful bubble that we live in. We do need to, we do need to int introduce the awareness and the different um, you know, what's happening in the society to them in an early age. The material that we introduce has to be age appropriate, in my opinion. My six-year-old daughter, uh, she still wants to marry her brother. So if at that age, <laughs> you know, introducing the gender identity issue, in my opinion, is probably too early. But my 12-year-old, who is going through puberty, has a girlfriend, 100%. He needs to understand completely what it means to everybody, to themselves, and to the society. Um, so I do think that it depends on um, the age. We do need to introduce the topic and, um, and then also uh, the material has to be right. But I do think it's important to introduce it. To me, it's not just about the school cur curriculum uh, because you can't learn anything in the textbook. My kids are not gonna learn about what it means to be biracial. I need to teach, teach that myself, you know, through our daily conversation and interaction. So I do think that everything that we are seeing and we're trying to teach our children is about the collaboration with uh, the school administration, the teachers, and the parents. We have to set the example, we have to set the role model, we have to reinforce whatever we want our children to learn at home as well. That's my belief. Chris McLaughlin. Thanks. Um, so as a school committee member, I'm not sure that my vote would necessarily be going towards um, something in that committee that you addressed or that you referenced or the initiative you referenced. 
Um, but what I can say is that the MERSD strategic plan overview does have a strategic initiative for what we all phrase the DEI, the diversity, equity, and inclusion. And DEI is what we have all, well, what we hope to all be teaching our children. Kindness, respect, uh, including everyone, and loving everyone. And it's always been a part of our lives, and DEI is what we hope that everyone teaches their kids. So just like, um, and, and to go one step further, just like math, um, you don't teach calculus to a first grader. I think with regard to the gender identity issues that have been brought up, you don't teach um, certain gender identity issues to a first grader either. So I do believe that those issues are appropriate and right. And of course, now in 2022, things are a lot different than when I was in grade school. So I recognize that and I appreciate that. And our district also does. Um, but I also think that parents should have a voice. Parents should understand what their kids are going to be taught before it's brought up in school. I think parents should know what it is, when it's gonna be taught, and how it's going to be incorporated into the school day. And if parents want to know, the parents deserve a right to know, they have a right to know that because when their first grader comes home asking questions, they should know what their kid was taught that day or how it was brought up and how they can adequately respond to their child. And if a book is going to be read, maybe that parent wants to read the book first before their kid goes to school that day. So, like I said, just like calculus, I think age-appropriate integration of gender identity and other issues uh, that are social topics, this current hot topics right now, um, they could be addressed, but I think there's a proper way to address them, and most important, with parent involvement in our community. Thanks. Roger. So, I think when I read my piece earlier, I think that was the email I was responding to. <laughs> so I think Lindsay, right? So I've, I've sort of answered the question. I think specifically she was asking about racism. I, I just want to repeat, you know, regardless of how you feel about racism, I think, you know, I, I, I grew up, you know, learning that racism was wrong. All my, my circle knew that racism was wrong. All my friends now know that racism is wrong. The reality is, you know, in some parts of this country, they're trying to stop kids from knowing about racism in our history, stop kids from knowing about racism in this country right now. It still exists now. And I think it has to be a core part of the school's mission to let kids know that that's not going to be acceptable. The reality is when they go out into the world, I mean, I can speak for the tech industry. I can't speak for all industries. But I have a lot of clients in other industries. I've, I've, you know, my clients have been in all different parts of the country. I can tell you for the last 25 years, everybody I've worked with, every company I've worked with, as a client or an employee, if you have a racist bone in your body, the world's gonna take a baseball bat to your head. It's not gonna be acceptable. And I think just from that perspective, the school needs to be, you know, just be a bulwark against any of this creeping, you know, well, let's not let the kids know about this. We have to let the kids know about it. We have to make sure that they're not, you know, that, that they understand at a very deep level that, you know, racism is wrong. Dr. Spencer. Um, thank you. So, uh, Lindsay, to answer, I think, at least part of your question, do I support our school committing to anti-racism? Yes, I do. Um, I think our role in this school is to prepare, not our role as a school community, but our role as a district is to prepare our students for a future that will inevitably be far more diverse than the community that they are growing up in. Um, and it's gonna look very different. And diversity and inclusion is a priority at every single college these students apply to. It is a priority at almost every business these students will someday look at. So yeah, is that part of our role uh, in the school? Absolutely. Um, we're getting into a lot of really complex issues of, of when and if certain subjects are covered. I think the best way I can address them is to say, I think we really need to trust our educators 
Um, I do, I, I agree that parents deserve a voice in the process, but I'm not sure I see exactly the mechanism that's being proposed. I don't think that it would be reasonable to suggest that every single book in our library is approved by every parent. I think we are going to hire good, educated librarians that make thorough and comprehensive choices about age-appropriate books, and those books will and should reflect the diversity of the world around us. Um, in terms of the timing of certain topics, of sensitive, uh, sensitive topics, and when they're introduced in a classroom, I'm not going to tell you I know the answers to that. I don't. Um, but I do believe that we are hiring people that will and that this topic is being given a lot of consideration. So um, that's, I think, the best I can say is that we should be committing to promoting the discussion of diversity because our kids need that going forward into a global world. First of all, I just want to thank you all because uh, having served on a number of school committees, um, whoever is successful in this, I will tell you that you most likely will not end with more praise and friends that you started with. But, um, <laughs> um, but, it, but I have to say it's just so important and it's so nice to see that we have a choice and that we can hear from all of you. So my question, and Eric, I think you actually already addressed this, so I'd like to hear from the others, is I'm just curious um, where you all stand on how much parent input should drive district decisions on materials and curriculum versus relying on maybe rec recommendations from uh, professional staff, your teachers, your superintendent, and maybe state's guidance on certain issues. Um, and, uh, thanks. And Lynn. And by the way, I'm sorry, I've just made this presumption that that's how you prefer to be addressed. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> um, how much involvement should, should the parents have in the school curriculum? In, yes, in, in curriculum decisions, as opposed to hearing as a school committee member from your professional staff and maybe state guidance on those issues. Uh, I might be, uh, I, I don't think the parents should f review everything, like the, you know, the list of the library books and whatnot, um, but, because I do trust um, our, you know, our educators as well and working with the you know, school administration. So I do think that every parent is different and every household and, and how, what you believe is different. So I do think that it's up to the parents to see how much they want to be involved. But keep in mind that we, this is a public school. There are specific curriculums that we have to follow. Um, so for me, at least, I would like to understand exactly what are some of the guidelines that we have to follow, what are some of the things that uh, is up to us. And whatever that's up to us, we do need to decide as a community. Back to the DEI questions that we were talking about earlier. Anti-racism, racism, this is going to take a long time for it to go away, completely go away. I think that personally, the fact that we're here all together talking about anti-racism is great. So the the question is how we want to uh, ha have this. How do we want to approach this? But everybody has different view. I do think it's all about understanding um, what the different views are and really respect it and come to a, a compromising way to figure out, to cater, what are some of the parents, if they want to know very detailed about the, the school reading and whatnot, here is your option. For the parents really want to just let the educator to drive it, here is the option. Uh, but I, I do think that it's important for us to understand the baseline. What is the, uh, the minimum limit, uh, the guideline from the, from the state and from the federal uh, when it comes to uh, school curriculum? But I do think that we all have a choice to decide what we want for our children. Uh, but we do think that we need to work together with the uh, school administration. Eric Bradford. So I guess the best way to answer this is to say that, you know, it is not really within the purview of the school committee to micromanage curriculum. There is a law in Massachusetts that was passed in 1997 uh, that specifically relates to this as relates to sexual issues, um, a lot of the topics that were brought up earlier. Um, there are very clear guidelines that were set by the school committee at that time by directive of the state. Um, and I don't know about for the elementary school and the high school, I know in the middle school it takes up an entire page in the student parent handbook. So there are clear mechanisms 
for notifying parents about uh, certain books or, I guess, films or any other sort of uh, material that are going to be shown to kids that might be questionable under the definitions of this law. Um, you know, as a student, as a, uh, sorry, as a son of educators, I can just say, you know, I, I would tend to trust uh, teachers uh, to provide appropriate, you know, most of the teachers have kids of their own. They're, they're not going to be inappropriate in the things that they provide to students. Um, and if anybody's concerned that that might be coming down the road, that there might be something, and I can't even think of an example, you know, other than what I was talking about before, with, uh, with uh, uh, racism and history, um, you know, I found the teachers here to be very open and communicative. I mean, if you if if you feel like your uh, son or daughter is going into a history class where they might be offered some curriculum that uh, that would be counter to your beliefs, I'm sure the teachers, if you email them, will tell you what um, they're going to be seeing, and you could have a discussion about uh, that with them. But it, that's not part of what the school committee does outside of setting that policy uh, back in 1997. Kristen McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, so I think the question was how much input should go into purchasing books or curriculum um, for our school and the children in our school. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and be different than all three other candidates. I do not and will not trust uh, the schools to make the best decisions for my children in all aspects of their life. I will not do that. I am their parent. The school is not their parent. If our, as far as social issues, health issues, and family issues, I am the responsible adult in my children's life. And so when the school gets involved with those decisions or those issues, I do want to know what books are being purchased. I do want to know what books are being read to my children in first grade, second grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. And if our school committee in 1997 made guidelines to address health issues or sex identity issues or sex ed issues, then maybe our new school committee should readdress them because quite frankly, 2022 is a different place than 1997 was. And all of the issues that are encompassed and being taught at school are significantly different than they were when I was in seventh grade. So um, I would say, yes, I do trust the teachers to teach my children academics. And I want to be able to rely on those teachers to teach those kids math and science and geography and meet the state guidelines, get them into college and do well uh, in the AP classes and do well in college. But as far as uh, other issues, yes, as a parent, I do want to be informed and I do not trust the schools to make those family issues for me. Thank you. Careful, Spencer, although, um... I think there's some different aspects to this question, so if you want to uh, uh, expand on any of your previous answers, I'll give you the opportunity. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, th I think I did address. You're happy. You're that, happy with your previous that, answers. Uh, yes. Nothing to add. <laughs> Thank you. Nothing okay. to add at this time. Uh, I'm going to go over here now. <laughs> My name is Caroline Fauchot, I'm a firm, I live in Manchester. Uh, I'm going to ask today, I'm a first teacher here in high school, and middle school, and I'm also mother of the four grades at the Memorial. And I have to say that, you know, I've been working here, I'm new to the city and to the district, and I see a lot of dedicated teachers who work here every day and really care for your kids in terms of academic, social, emotion, uh, emotional, I mean, everything. So, you know, I think we have a very good team here. Uh, and that's why also I moved to Manchester and so far I don't regret my decisions. However, uh, I'm very disappointed about one thing that the district provides is the food. And, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I'm French, I have to talk about the food. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I come from a country where we have uh, a four-course meal on the table, when we have an hour 
and had for lunch, 45 minutes sitting and 45 minutes where we can have a recess. And during these 45 minutes, we learn how to eat and what we eat, and how it is made, and where it does come from. So, you know, the school is talking all of the districts, you know, about the vision of the graduates and about the globalization and the city of the world. But I'm not sure that by providing the food we give to the kids today, we encourage that. Because when the food for this week is cheese pizza, chicken nuggets, waffle, mac and cheese, and cheese pizza. So within five days, we have twice cheese pizza. <laughs> So every day, I need to provide lunch for my daughter. She doesn't have access to a microwave, I don't know why. So, you know, it's cold, cold meals all the time. Tomorrow, she's happy with the waffles. I'm not very happy about her having all of this amount of sugar and salt. And we know now that food is very important, you know, in how we behave and the, the impact the food has on our emotion and how we study, because when you see kids after lunch like this, depending on what they eat, you know, they don't learn the same way. So it has a lot of consequences. We are surrounded by beautiful farms. And I know, because I've heard that before, the school district provided a different food at school. So I would like to know, as a school member, school committee, what would you do to try to provide a good meal for our kids here? <laughs> this is um, near and dear to my heart. Um, I think school lunches are really important for our kids. And like you said, um, what they eat halfway through the day really uh, decides how their demeanor and feelings are going to be after lunch and by 3 p.m. when they are at dismissal. Um, when I started my kids here, um, I actually got really involved with the school lunch program. I emailed and met with Avi Urbis, who is the finance guy in the high school or the superintendent offices, and I know he's also involved in the school committee meetings, but I was involved with him. I actually just pulled up a few emails that I went to him um, back in May, as early as May of 2019, when my kids were, I believe, in kindergarten. Um, so as soon as we moved here, that was something that was really important to me because I saw um, the potential for better school lunches. And when I met here, when I actually, when I told you guys I had done interviews at other districts, one thing I asked was about the meal plan. Um, I remember John Willis, the principal of Memorial, telling me about um, the gardens that they grew and how they do basically farm to table at the school and how they used to have salad bars and the children have the opportunity to put lettuce on their plate every day. Um, I believe that happened and then COVID hit and it doesn't happen anymore. Um, I actually met with the woman named Paula Graham, who is in charge of ordering those specific meals that are given to our children every day. Um, I met with her on two separate occasions, and then COVID hit, and we couldn't make progress. Um, and now this year, I again started to look into this program, but because there is the free lunch program for everyone through the state, um, there's limited flexibility and with what I as a parent and nothing more in this district had the ability to do to work with people um, but I believe nutrition of our children is so important and when they can do farm to table and there's beautiful garden beds right outside here that I hope this spring they use and they can garden and bring it to the um, lunchroom but I assure you, if I'm on the school committee, I will work for that because that was something I said in my introduction here today already. Um, it's near and dear to my heart. I have an Instagram page called Kristen's Fit Fam, and I think um, I, I, I just think food is really important to learning. I know um, there's a lot of different foods that you can use, and I'm not on a platform here to talk about it, but. I think our nutrition of our kids is really important and like I said I've already reached out to people in the past 
And if I'm on the school committee, I'm absolutely going to take that up as a topic. Eric Bradford. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, when my son was a toddler and we met with uh, our pediatrician about this, he actually held out to French as the model of, you know, how we should teach our kids to eat. Um, you know, they, she said, she sort of contrasted what we feed kids in America versus what they feed kids in France and told us how to, you know, incorporate those sorts of things um, by just constant repetition and sort of modeling that that's the right thing to eat. Um, to answer the question, you know, I, I've, this is the first year that my son's eaten school lunch, and I'm sort of equally horrified by, <laughs> by what they, they give them. Uh, I'm not sure why that is. It sounds like it's partly a, a state issue, um, but I, I would love to dig into that. I, I, I'm, I'm like a lot of Americans, you know, my, my uh, awareness of uh, different uh, nutritional approaches has expanded a lot over the years. Fifteen years ago, I didn't know what a vegan was, and now I think I have like ten vegan cookbooks. I try to cook out of them whenever I can um, because I've learned, like a lot of people have, uh, the value of uh, eating better. So I, I guess to answer the question, it's, uh, you know, it's something I would, I would love to look into, but I don't have any direct experience with why they are just, you know, all the kids are cheesitarians and pastafarians. I don't know. Eric Spencer. Um, okay, I, well, so first of all, I'm hungry now. <laughs> Second of all, I have bad news because the freshman class has been actively engaged in polling the student body to determine what meals are most preferable, and you've got it, she's pizza one. <laughs> um, so one thing that we're going to be up against is the fact that the student body is now for better or worse, actively engaged in their lunch choices, um, and this is some of what they've been requesting. Uh, I, too, remember a time, um, I, I actually remember weeding the memorial gardens and watering the memorial gardens. So we do have gardens at both schools, and it's definitely something that we let go during COVID. Um, I don't know if everybody knows, but during COVID, all school lunches became free. I think that's a statewide mandate. So a bunch of things have become uniform that were never uniform in the past. And I do think we're going to have an opportunity to move back to trying to involve those gardens, both in terms, I mean, the gardens used to be not only part of the food we ate, but also part of science class. So I think you're going to see more of that. And that would certainly be something that we could consider more. Ms. Mitchell. I think we all, we all know that um, the school Food is not a great. The elementary school food uh, is even worse. My six year, uh, my sixth grader at uh, middle school actually loves the food. So I asked, I reached out to Pam as well last week and asked exactly the same question: What can we do better to improve the food quality? Um, I do think that there's some uh, contractual agreement we currently have with the food vendor. So I do think one thing I would like to understand more is what is our existing contractual agreement. How, what can we add on in addition for the, the more the healthier food uh, for kids? Keep in mind, if I remember it correctly, Pam, is we have been running deficits in our food budget. Regard so I would like to look at the numbers to see how we can turn this around. At the same time, to also improve the quality of the food. Um, so is I do think that we need to approach this from both sides. Next question. I'll get you next. Uh, this is a question for Kristen McLaughlin. Um, in the cricket, you stated complete transparency on any social agendas being promoted in our schools is in order. Um, this includes books in the library. So it's sort of a, you know, a two-portion question. The first is, um, it sounds like you have concerns about social agendas being promoted in the school system. So I'd like to know what those concerns are. And the second question I have is about books in the library. Do you have concerns about books pertaining to the history of civil rights in this country or literature regarding the Holocaust or the LGBTQ community? And if so, what are those concerns? Thank you. So I, I think um, what, what she's referring to in the cricket, cricket is, um, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but I stated it briefly again in my introduction. Um, any social agendas that may be pushed onto our children, I think the parents should be aware of. Um, as far as books go, I referenced um, on my Facebook page, 
a book that was going to be read to third graders in the Danvers Public School District. Um, Danvers Public School gave parents one week notice uh, before they started instituting gender identity curriculum uh, right before spring break this past April. Um, the parents were notified in each grade what uh, book their child would be read and that was it. The teachers were not trained as to how to incorporate that into the classroom. All they were told was to read a book and that and the parents were told that this is the book that their child would be read on each grade level first grade second grade third grade and um, I'm assuming through fifth so my position is that parents in our district should that go to our district should this come up as a topic before our community my position is that us as parents should be informed that this is going to happen that our children are going to be read these books and if you have a concern if it's a family issue if it's a personal issue if you want to address those issues with your kids first before they go to school in first grade and hear about them then the parents should have knowledge and awareness and there should be transparency with what our kids are learning and being taught in school so as far as uh, the transparency goes and books in the library I didn't physically mean in the library, I meant books in the classroom, I guess is a better way to say it, and maybe I should have said it better in the cricket, but um, books our kids are being read is just one piece of this um, curriculum that other districts are incorporating, and I have no problem with the curriculum. I have a problem with the parents not being told it was happening and not understanding what's happening and not knowing it was going to happen and not having a say in it. Um, so it's not about what the curriculum entailed. My problem with the other districts was the parents didn't know. There was no notice. There was no transparency and the parents were left dumbfounded when their kids came home and they didn't know what happened in school that day. And like I said about calculus in first grade, there are some topics that some families want to save for their kids when they get older and maybe not a first or second grade issue. Um, so I think those are times and reasons and concerns parents in our community may have and foresee that coming forward to our district. And my position is transparency with the parents and having the parents uh, talk to me and or the school committee and just knowing what's happening with our kids when we're not with them. Does that answer your question pretty much? So that was a question specifically to Ms. McLaughlin. Um, I'm going to go back for the next question back here.
who are very accepting and kind. I felt unsafe to come out to even my parents until I was 16. And to put transgender people under scrutiny, because that's what putting these folks up to parents if you have decisions, it is creating a rift between children, transgender kids and not. It creates an abnormal and a normal. And this uh, notion has made me and many of my friends uncomfortable. So my question is, what are you willing to do to make accommodations for gender queer youth to feel comfortable and accepted in their own community? Thank you for your question, and thanks for standing up and reaching out. I know it was probably really difficult for you, and if not, um, you're going to be a great public speaker one day. But um, I think people maybe have misunderstood my Facebook posts. Um, like I had said in my past uh, comments, my position on school committee is not about my personal beliefs or my political views or what I do for my religion. My position on school committee is to make sure our children as a whole are taught what they need to be taught to grow up and live their lives as adults. So when it comes to family values, I believe it's my job as a parent to teach my kids what I believe as far as my religion goes or what are any other values. Um, I think first and foremost, like I have already said today, we support kindness, we support inclusion, we support having friends of at all types. So when people, um, read my post and say that I don't like the third grade book that Danvers Public Schools are reading because that's what my post is about, I'm sure you're referring to. If you really read what I wrote, I said the parents weren't informed, the parents didn't know it was coming until a week before school vacation, and the parents want to know what their kids are going to be learning in that third grade classroom as eight-year-olds before their kids are learning about it. For example, the post I'm talking about is about a book where there's, I, I believe, I didn't actually read the whole book, but I believe it's about a girl that is in elementary school and she thinks she's a boy. And in third grade, they're reading it. and. There was a synopsis given to the Danvers parents, which I read, and that was it. They read it in school. The parents weren't given a copy. The parents don't know how to address their children when they came home. And being a Danvers native, I spoke with a lot of my friends that have third graders in Danvers public schools. Almost every single parent was really disappointed. I'm sorry, I don't think you're answering the question that the student asked. Excuse me. Let me, let me handle that. To support students. Well, like I said, I don't believe my role as a school committee member is necessarily to address these issues. Um, we already have strategic plan overview with 20 something objectives in it. One of the things is the DEI program, diversity, equity, inclusion. I would think that that would fall in that program. What more would you want me as a school committee member to do? Do you have a response or? So actually, I think okay. what they're asking is, uh, as, as is. recognize that this is a human being that 
Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. I'm sorry. I understand. I understand. The, I understand. There's going to be a lot of emotion around this, but you're going to have to let me facilitate this, and this can't turn into just a conversation okay, between so random folks back and forth between a candidate. Otherwise, this would be train wreck. All right. So let me, let me as much as possible. Sarah, I'm just going to ask you a question. The question is about so, rewarding students. Hang on. Hang. On. So. One of the, one of the um, uh, roles of the school committee is to develop policy for the district. Policy affects such things as emotional well-being programs, and to that extent, school committee members do make decisions about programs that will affect <coughs> and deal with the issue that this person just raised. Okay. So, they want to what know from I, you, okay. how you how you, as a school committee member, would address policy to address Thank you. the concern. Okay. So, like I have said from the very beginning, I would talk to the parents. The parents in this district are parents just like me. Or students in this district are students like my children. If there are concerns that people have with regard to equity or inclusion and the school district is not incorporating the DEI program the way that it should, then that would be something the school committee could address. Um, as far as making additional policies, I guess we would have to know what policies are needed. But frankly, I don't know the answer to that because I don't, I'm not on the school committee. So if somebody came to me with questions or issues with regard to inclusion, I would absolutely listen to you and see how we can incorporate um, any changes that need to be made into our district policy. I don't know if there's any more I need to add to that, but as a school committee member, adding making policy is making policy. Um, and as, as far as, uh, parent voices go, that's where I stand. I want the parents to know what's happening with their elementary kids. That was the point of my post. So I hope that clarified things for everyone. Um, but it, it's not in any way to make anyone feel excluded, but to make sure that the parents feel included. I hope that makes sense. All right, I'm going to move on to the next step. Sorry, just to clarify, uh, who's on shirt? Sure. You're saying that you have no intentions yourself of making any new policies to help uh, transgender children who feel uncomfortable or unwelcome in school. So, uh, I would address those issues as they arise. Okay, thank you. That's all I have to uh, hear that. I'm not sure everyone.
an idea that parents should have control over social and emotional issues in a public education. My direct question for Kristen is that you mentioned point blank that your trust in the school and teachers for academics, specifically you stated math, science, and reading, and you mentioned not trusting them for teaching social and emotional issues to our children. Do you think there is any space for educators to know more than the parents about what exactly is appropriate social and emotional education in a public school setting? So I'm going to take a liberty and recast this, this, this question just a little bit so that it, all, all the members have an opportunity to um, uh, answer an aspect of it that I think is probably fairly important. And the way I'll rephrase it is, um, we, we typically, uh, uh, classically, have a notion of uh, educators as uh, providing academic instruction. To what extent do you feel, by law and by policy, the district, and, and in what manner does the district have a responsibility, an obligation, or a, a business to teach social, historical, emotional issues within their curriculum. And if, uh, if you object to my rephrasing of that question, all right. So we're gonna go randomly, and my little random name selection app says, <laughs> <laughs> Ms. McLaughlin. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think I've already said this, um, I'm not sure how much more I can rephrase it, but the, I think when it comes to family values that some parents believe are important in their children's lives, or some things that are difficult to talk about, then the parents should know their children are learning about it, especially in elementary school. Um, when we get to middle and high school, children are more uh, independent and they can read books, they can go to PG-13 movies, they can go on YouTube without me as the parent watching them over their shoulder. Um, so I think when it comes to social issues or um, core family values, then in elementary school, the parents should know it's happening if they're being if the children are being taught social issues if it's academic issues i think as a parent we hope our children are being taught academic issues um, so my platform is if i have a platform parent knowledge and transparency and school district accountability and so that's still since seven o'clock now at nine o'clock what i stand for um, and what I'm going to continue to support. I want the parents to know that they have a voice in our community, and if the parents disagree with something that the school board's doing, or if the parents have concerns that they want addressed, or if 600 parents want to talk at a school committee meeting and not get muted on Zoom, that they have an opportunity to um, speak their voice and they could speak it to me if we don't have time for 600 parents to talk on Zoom on a school committee meeting. But I want to be a voice for the parents and the community as a whole to have somebody on the school committee that will address real life concerns. And if that means parents are knowledgeable about what their elementary eight, nine, 10, five-year-olds are learning, then that's what I stand for. Ms. Mitchell. Personally, I do think that when we are limiting specific things, well, first of all, this is public school, which represents what's happening in the world today. So I do believe that when you're limiting specific things to your children, that is creating a divide, not just within the school body, also in your children's mind, in my opinion, personally, just based on my experience. Because the children, they do get it really quickly, and they do learn things very early on. But it's about how you introduce it to them uh, the different topic. Just like I mentioned earlier, my six-year-old is going to receive things differently than my 12-year-old when it comes to specific social um, topics. 
but it's not for me. It's not just about the academics. I rather to have a well-rounded, good human as a college graduate than an ignorant um, PhD. That, in my opinion, so I do think it's very important to make sure that we continue to be aware of the social issues and then continue to raise the awareness to our children and among ourselves, for the adults too, we can continue <coughs> to learn. I see in the past few weeks how this community gets divided into the different topics. I do think that we do need to come together. It's not just about the, uh, I do think that all these topics need to be embedded into what, we, what the teachers teach every day because we cannot be talking to our kids during the day they're in school. The teacher need to um, embed the material um, to whatever that's appropriate. At home, we need to teach our children to whatever that's appropriate. I get that different households might have different expectations, but I do need to. I do think that we need to be inclusive and to make sure that we are uh, introducing all the the real issues to our children at different age, whatever that's appropriate. Mr. Bradford. <clears throat> um, so. Since it's after 9 o'clock now, people are starting to leave. I just wanted to take this opportunity, I'm sure I speak on behalf of all the other candidates, to thank Eli, Erica, the Cricket, and everybody who, um, you know, is working on this project, everybody who showed up tonight. Um, you know, I was told it would be maybe 10 people, and, <laughs> it's, a lot of, and it's fantastic. I mean, you know, it, it, it makes it worth doing, and I think, you know, we're, we're having some good discussions here. Uh, to answer the question, um, you know, I, I sort of referred to this earlier. I think, you know, to some extent it's a moot point because there's a law in Massachusetts, that, so the question becomes, do we change the law? Um, the, for, for the, for the uh, school committee to uh, make changes to the policy around the law, I really don't think there's much of a difference between the year the law was enacted and now because the law is very general and it, re it relies on the discretion of the teacher to determine what parents should be notified about. I think on a personal level, you know, a lot of the topics that we're talking about are just things that are true in the world. You know, my son found out that about, you know, homosexual couples when I brought him to see uh, my friend when he was three years old, my, the best man at my wedding, and his boyfriend. And that was a very easy conversation. He didn't need to worry about, you know, oh, this is, this is strange. I, I wasn't hiding anything from him. And I think when we talk about you know, parents have the opportunity to to hide things from their kids. That's by law. I think I don't agree with that personally. Uh, but you have you have the chance to do that. Um, again, as the son of educators, I tend to trust educators to take the temperature of the community to understand what's going to be acceptable and what's not going to be acceptable. Um, and you know, I think. We've been talking a lot about a, a social media post here. I think if you go look at that social media post, I was very encouraged to see that a lot of the people who came down on the side of, you know, um, uh, letting, uh, not, you know, not, this, not hiding these things from kids were from Manchester. And a lot of the people who were pushing back were from Florida and other places, so. Ms. Spencer. Um, I think your question was what our role is um, in teaching diversity to our students, right? It was... <clears throat> I've, I've lost um, track a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was actually, it, in what manner and to what, uh, uh, and to what degree um, do uh, social and um, uh, emotional well-being topics fit into the curriculum and should they to, to what where should in, in how should they be fit into the curriculum and should they um, so my view on that is diversity and inclusion is a framework through which our educators teach students to access the curriculum and I think this happens throughout um, from K through 12 Teaching diversity and inclusion can start really early and it doesn't have to be the type of diversity we might be talking about right now. It happens all the time. Um, it happens in a math class. I, you know, it, I don't think you can separate out this approach and this framework from what some of us have referred to as the core subjects. I think we should constantly be teach, you know, teaching through a framework of uh, inclusion and tolerance. Um, 
And I guess when it comes to things like literature that's introduced in the classroom, I, I, I don't mean to be heard as saying parents don't have a voice because I think they do. I think parents come to the school committee with concerns and I think that's fair and that's good. Um, but at the same time, I do think that we should be hiring the very best educators. It's something we haven't talked enough about tonight, but that is really what a major goal of our school system should be. We should be hiring the best educators that we can, and we should be trusting them to do their job. And when it comes to age-appropriate literature, um, if it is age-appropriate, I don't, I, that literature should at times reflect the diversity of our world, not the diversity of Manchester by the Sea. That means it's gonna include all types of lifestyles. <laughs> In that sense, I, I do not want my kids uh, learning about inappropriate things at um, a young age, but I do want age-appropriate books that, that deal with different topics. And you know what? I kind of welcome, as a parent, tough topics. Give me a tough conversation with my kids. I welcome that. That's education. That's what I think it's all about. All right. Thank you all for being here, for being so candid in your answers. I'm just wondering, I, I know we, my name is Eleanor Jeffrey, and I live in Manchester. And um, this, you know, might be a little unpopular, but um, I'd like to know from, when you're talking about inclusion uh, from a minority uh, perspective, as in, uh, you know, free, you know uh, when someone has a different opinion, what, ha what would you do for children who have a different religious uh, view than one that's described uh, that you've all been talking about this evening? Now, I, I understand that Kristen is leaving it to the parents, but what, what would you do to protect my child if I brought, I, of course, I would want my, both my girls to be respectful to any child they encounter, but if I have a different view of uh, the sexual agenda that I feel is being promoted in the schools, what will you do to protect my child who might have a different opinion? Um, I, I, I think that's... And I'm not saying it to be snappy or anything like that. I'm not saying no, I, someone who homeschools their kid and wants yeah. to bring them into the public school here. So I'm not saying it to give someone like... I, I really want to have a discussion because yeah. it does uh, factor into whether I would send more children here. Um, yeah, I appreciate the question, and I think it's an important one, because I think when we talk about respecting opinions, we have to be able to respect all opinions. Um, opinions have to be presented in a way that are, are kind. Um, I think opinions have to be presented in a way that show tolerance. But I absolutely think, I mean, you know, my favorite area in law was First Amendment. We are a public school system. Um, there are first, you know, we, we need to be encouraging dialogue. I guess that's what I think is the most important. There should be dialogue. It should not be that we can't talk about certain issues because they're um, too sensitive. I mean, again, I, I think I might differ with some of the candidates in that sense. Like, I think hard conversations are good conversations. I think that's what education means. Um, so I think having multiple voices is always productive if we can do it in a good and respectful way. Ms. McLaughlin. Thanks. Um, I think uh, to go to the core of this and, um, you know, my position is just that the parents should understand what's being taught. But as far as including everyone, I think our school district does a good job of making kids of all religions feel included. Um, I know my kids have friends with multiple different um, religious backgrounds and they thrive with it. I mean, my daughter's best friend is of a different religion and I learn from my daughter the other religion and it's awesome and it's really cool. So I, I, um, I'm not concerned with including everyone. Um, I would just be in concerned if a religion was taught in the school by a teacher, which is, you know, basically what I've been saying all night, is that um, 
I want to know what my kids are learning and when they're learning it and know before they learn it so that if I need to opt out, like you may want to, you can do that. And that would be my position. That's where I've stood from day one is that if my kids are going to be learning something I don't agree with, or if anyone's kids are learning something that we don't agree with, we know ahead of time what they're gonna be learning. And, and if it's something about religion or something you disagree with, uh, you as a parent would have the knowledge to know ahead of time. Um, Ms. McLaughlin, can you clarify what you mean by opt out? I don't know what the policies are in the district on opting out, but I know that I'll find out if I'm a school committee member. And I know if I disagree with some something that my kids are going to be taught, I won't be sending them that day for that portion of the uh, program. So I don't know. I don't know everything. I don't know all the answers, but I know, I know that if I disagree with something or if my kid is too young to be learning something that we don't talk about at home, because they're in first grade and I don't think they're age appropriate to learn about it yet, then I would want a provision to not put my kid in that class that day. Um, I don't know if that exists, but I would look into it. Mr. Bradford. I, I think I lost the thread of the question a little bit. I think you're asking about religion specifically, it kind of turned toward- Well, I'm, I'm, you know, and I, I, I appreciate you, um, you all dialoguing about this. I feel that some of the agenda, like I don't want my children taught to in first, second, third grade uh, about gender identity or any of that. Um, you know, I want my child to be considerate to everyone else, just as I wouldn't expect, uh, other people wouldn't expect me to put on them what I think. So I would like to know, you know, if there's a way to opt out, I would like to know in a history class, for instance, if uh, or some social class, uh, you know, I would like to know what's being taught. If in an English class there's some provocative books that I think might be kind of grooming, I want to know about it because I've heard it in other, in, you know, it, you know, we all have seen it on TV where the, um, you know, the parent gets up and reads a book and, they, and the, you know, everyone said, don't read that. There are kids listening. So I want to be able to know what my kids are reading. I, and I, I looked on the, you know, to be fair, I looked on the, um, you know, the course offerings and I don't see a book list. So I'm wondering, is that something that we can see? So if someone's taking an English class, we know exactly what books they're reading. Because I know, you know, that that's, when I pick a curriculum for my kids, so, I know exactly what they're reading. I, I hear what you're, you're asking. Um, but, but that specific question is actually a question that seems to me it would be something that you would address the administration. Well, everyone else was asking questions to see what everyone felt about it, so I thought it was appropriate that I asked a question along those lines. I might be in the but I thought it was appropriate. So, um, let's see if we can rephrase it just a little bit. Um, what you're asking is of the candidates is do you feel, do you support and feel that there is a, a, both a, a means and a need to communicate more effectively the content of the curriculum yes. and the content of the reading material. Yes. Are, you, are you okay with that? Yes. So let's start this one question over and unless anybody else has any other questions specific to this. Can I offer just some factual information that might be helpful to framing the answer? It'll take you two seconds. Yeah. Um, as a public school, our K-12 scope and sequence is governed by the Massachusetts State Framework, which outlines by grade level uh, what the expectation is for us to teach in the content level. Our teachers are excellent, and they make excellent decisions on behalf of their students, but they're not generating curriculum independently in each classroom. When you hit the high school level, you'll receive scope and sequence and syllabus per class 
at the time you're enrolled in a class. The program of studies is a broad outline of the courses that we offer. The majority of elementary programs are uh, national programs. I wish Literacy Woman was still here because we did align three years ago uh, to the science of reading uh, guidelines that were put out by uh, the Mass ESC. So I just want to make sure that everyone's clear that while there's some level of uh, teacher responsibility for putting materials together and developing lessons, we are obligated to adhere to the state frameworks, which includes all of the topics that we've been discussing tonight, LGBTQ issues, uh, issues of DEI, which is a process, not a curriculum. And um, we will continue to follow those guidelines until uh, the state tells us we cannot. So again, um, uh, what question is going to be raised, the theme that's been raised multiple times is the issue of communicating um, curriculum and the need. And I'm not doing it as a gotcha. I, I, I really do want to know. What's that? I said I, these questions, the questions I'm asking aren't as a gotcha. I just really want to know how right, it was, right, right, right. You know, someone so, a so let me try to get to a constructive question that everybody can answer as opposed to let's having a uh, little fight, fight amongst each other because it's starting to, to ride down a little bit into it. So the question is, um, the question, the theme that I've seen raised here a couple of times is the, the degree to which you support and how you would support doing a better job and do you see a need for doing a better job for communicating the curriculum the material the content that's going to be taught to the residents and i hope that was clear enough and i'm just going to go left to right this time mr bradford i'll keep it quick because i gotta get my kid to bed he's got my and cast tomorrow um yeah, I think, as I said before, I think that any teacher that you would reach out to would provide you with a list of books. I think in a lot of cases it wouldn't occur to teachers that any of the curriculum that they're providing would necessarily be offensive to anyone. If the question is, should they be able to hide that, or no, they, but I don't think they would. Um, so if it's a matter of posting lists of books online, I don't think anybody would really object to that. The bigger question is, what do you do if you find something that you don't like? Now you're carving out a piece of that class, and the question is, can the rest of the, the lesson that that class is teaching over the course of a trimester or a year hold together if you, if you make that carve out? That is really, you know, it's a case-by-case -case basis. It's something you'd have to deal with with the school. Thank you. Mr. McLaughlin. Thanks. Um, I think what I would go re revert back to is just um, to know how old my kid the kid is in question what grade we're talking about and what what class you're looking at getting this curriculum brought home prior to the kids being taught it um, like I said I think um, and I think the question related to communicating curriculum and content to the um, family and I think uh, in elementary school, if it's um, some type of new content that's getting incorporated into our classrooms, then I think that uh, that should be something that's communicated to parents as we get into older grades where the kids can communicate with their parents if they talk to their parents anymore in high school, then I think there's less need for the parents to be notified ahead of time of the curriculum changes. Um, but I think as a parent, even if I have a high schooler, I'd like to know if there are curriculum changes and, um, and how they would impact my family and my family's life. Um, so yeah, I think with regard to elementary school, those communications should be more extensive, but uh, I'd still like to know in high school as well. Ms. Mitchell. Like what Pam was saying, that um, there are specific guidelines that we have to follow uh, when it comes to curriculum. Um, I my take is, you ha as a parent has a right to do whatever you want to do, of course. Um, and my view is, this is a public school. I actually personally think that we are not um, introducing enough. Like I find myself actually, you know, for example, my fifth grade was t um, learning about religions uh, in in a school curriculum. It was only three. 
There are many other ones. So I was teaching my sons at home myself about Buddhism, about Taoism, all the religions I grew up with that is, is not taught at school, but that's okay. We all come from different backgrounds. I actually find myself actually had to do more to emphasize specific things, and that's my choice. That's my option. Uh, whatever op uh, whatever choices or a desire that you have, as, as a parent, you have the right. So I do think that you might want to reach out specifically to the school administration to know exactly ahead of time what you don't like, um, and then opt out if that's an op option. Um, if that helps. Okay. But I don't know if that's the school committee's responsibility um, so, to communicate that uh, out. Uh, the question with, that I rephrased was, uh, in, in what manner do you feel that there's a need to do a better job of communicating the specifics of the curriculum? I personally, right now, don't see that is see, not. The book list, like for English, you know. Excuse me. So I personally don't think that we're doing a bad job communicating, but of course there's always room for improvement. If there are a lot of parents who request to want to see more specific <coughs> list, sure, let's make, uh, make, to make that as a routine uh, distribution uh, from the teacher to send home or whatever that might be. Um, sure, there's always room for improvement. Ms. Spencer. Um, I think I'm starting to get redundant in some of these <laughs> responses, so I will try to be brief. Um, at a high level, should you as a parent have a right to understand the curriculum that your child is being taught? Absolutely. Um, I think that as far as I, you know, in my experience as a parent, I do. Um, I think though your question is more specific and gets to macro details, right, of what they're learning and specifically what books are being used to teach those principles. Um, I see that as being pretty challenging at an elementary school level because I'm not sure that whereas a freshman English class may have a specific list, I'm sure does have a specific list of literature they intend to introduce as a class, I'm guessing and in an early ed level, um, they turn to different books at different times depending on what they're experiencing in a classroom. I think that sounds much more challenging to administer. Um, you know. I, I think that it's certainly possible that you can go to the administration and say, I'd like to see um, a list. I'd like to look at the library. I'm not sure you're going to be satisfied with that because I think we are going to continue to have a library that includes, like I said, about 30 times. So I'm sorry to repeat myself, but I think our libraries will continue to include a diversity of literature that's, age, that's deemed age appropriate by our educators. Okay. So, um, I'm, uh, we've, I think we've reached essentially the end of the, the questions that we're going to get from the, the public tonight. Um, I'd like to make one or two quick closing comments again. First, thank you again, and thank you for the candidates. Everybody say thank you to the candidates. <laughs> and um, I guess I'd like to, to say one thing about these types of sessions and why I think they're important and why I hope that we see more of them in the future. When we see candidates write their positions in the paper, we get a carefully thought out um, piece that's probably been written over a number of hours unless you're an amazing um, orator, which most of us are not. <clears throat> and when you, see, when you see candidates answer questions that are, they've been given ahead of time, you get something similar with a little bit of a different tilt on it because it's a different public speaking. But these sessions, these extended sessions, are actually really important because they give you the opportunity to see how the candidates react to your questions. And how candidates react to your questions is very important. It gives you an idea of how they're going to perform in public debate. So I think in the future, more events that are extended like this even if they're uncomfortable in some respects, are extremely important. And I very much appreciate everybody participating tonight because this entire process is extremely important to the ongoing well-being of for staying here well over the time that was prescribed. And I want to thank uh, the school and everybody, uh, Severn 1623, who took the time to put this together. Um, and thank you all, and good night. Thank you.